Turn in your Bibles tonight, if you will, to the book of Romans chapter 16. The book of Romans chapter 16. Somebody said it earlier, say it again. Good to see Brother Griffin, his wife. Yeah, there she is. Good to see you folks here tonight, back after a lot of sickness. And it's good to see all of you tonight. And it's good to be seen. A lot of folks got up this morning. There's an old saying, you get up and tie your shoes of the morning, the undertaker may untie them before the day's out. I hope you'll be praying for our services this coming Lord's Day. Lord, to give us a good day. I know he wants to. He desires to. I had a pastor, his name was Dr. J.R. Uh, we called him Surratt. Over in the mountains, they called him Surratt's. But he used to make this statement, uh, preached his funeral while he was my pastor. But he used to make this statement. He said, we need revival. But he said, if God sent it, would we, would we be willing to accept it? That's a good statement. Because there's always a price involved when revival comes. So pray for, pray for revival. Pray that God will give us a good day in the Lord's house uh, this coming Sunday. I want to read one verse tonight. I'll be dealing with more than that, but I want to read uh, Acts chapter 6, excuse me, Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16 and uh, verse number 12. Romans chapter 16, verse number 12. Everybody have your Bibles. Amen. You got the right kind of Bible. All right. I want to make sure it's in there. If it's in there, you'll have to have the right kind of Bible. Romans chapter 16, verse number 12. Salute Tryphenia and Tryposa, who labored in the Lord. Salute the beloved Paris, which labored much in the Lord. Father, we thank you tonight again for the privilege of assembling here in the Lord's house. Thank you for each one present. And I pray you'll help us tonight, bless us tonight around the Word of God. In Jesus' name I pray for his sake. Amen. What's happening here in this chapter is the Apostle Paul is in remembrance of people who have been very special people in the church of Rome. Uh, these people are known and unknown. Basically, as you go down the list, probably most of them are not even known beyond their local neighborhoods. But after he's had time through the years to think about these people who contributed uh, to the church, he sends this letter back and he calls their names because he remembers certain traits about them. He remembers their faithfulness. He remembers the contribution that they made to the church over there in Rome. And outside of these people working and Paul calling their name, we would have never known anything about them. But in the mind of the Apostle Paul, they are very special people because they have contributed to the ongoing work of the church of Jesus Christ. So as he goes down the list, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he thinks about the women there in the church. And beside of these ladies, uh, he says just brief words about what he remembers about them. Some of the slaves there in the church, he calls their name, and then as he thinks about them, he says a word or two or a few words, and the other people there, the men in the church, uh, the houses, the homes that uh, opened up their doors and they allowed uh, the preachers to come in, they washed the saints' feet, uh, they ministered to them so that they could minister on behalf of uh, the people of the Lord Jesus Christ. And every time he, he thinks about somebody, 
He says something about them. Most of the times it's very minute, but he wants to, he wants these people to be saluted. Uh, he wants people to shake their hands. He wants people to say to them, we love you. We appreciate your work. Your work was not in vain. Your labor was not in vain. As I was reading this uh, this afternoon and thinking about it in anticipation of the service tonight, uh, the thought crossed my mind, uh, what, what, what are people going to say about us when we're going to heaven? Uh, what, will, what, will be the, what will be the summary statement when, we, when we're no longer here and our name comes up? What, what, what's people going to remember us for? You know, as you go through the Bible, you find certain characters in the Bible who died, and there are descriptive terms used to describe them. I was thinking just a few minutes ago, and I, I wrote this down about David and what he said about Abner in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 3 and verse number 33. Abner died, and the Bible said about David, and the king lamented over Abner and said, died Abner as a fool dieth. Now, wouldn't that be something to put on your tombstone? He or she died as a fool. But you won't find that on a tombstone. You know what you're going to find on the tombstone? That everybody died a saint. Uh, you, you, I've never gone through a cemetery anywhere and found any kind of an inscription on a tombstone that would lead you to believe that this person died lost. A little boy was walking around through the cemetery one day with his dad, and he was, they were, they was reading the epitaphs on the tombstone. And this one over here said, with Jesus. And this one over here said, in heaven. And this one over here said, reunited with mom or reunited with dad. And it went on and on. And they walked over about half the cemetery and the little boy's curiosity got the best of him. And he looked up at his dad and he said, dad, where do they bury the sinners? Because every tombstone led a, led a person to believe that everybody buried there, they're in the presence of the Lord. I like to quote that epitaph on a tombstone. It was found over in England. Somebody walked by and they noticed that written on the tombstone was this word, these phrases, just remember as you pass by, as you are now, so once was I. Prepare to die and follow me in eternity. And somebody came along, read that, took a pen out and a piece of paper, and added the following inscription. To follow you, I will not consent until, first of all, I know where you went. <laughs> There's another epitaph on a tombstone that says, Here lies the body of William Pease. The Pease not here but the pod. The Pease done shelled out and gone home to God. Now, you can go through the cemetery and you can see all of these, uh, all of these epitaphs. My dear wife, over yonder, I had put on her, uh, on her epitaph, and uh, don't have to have any doubt about it, don't have to have any question about it, I uh, have written right over her name, promoted. And that's what death is for a Christian. It's a promotion. Well, let me ask you something. Your descendants, 30 years from now or 50 years from now, and your name comes up, what are they going to remember you for? You say, well, uh, I did this and I did that. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. We ought to so live that they will remember, remember us from the spiritual perspective more than from the physical perspective. Uh, we, are, uh, we are right now laying down the groundwork for our character 
as to what people will summarize about us when they hear our name uh, in a few years. Uh, Solomon said this, that he, that he saw the people who had come and gone from the house of God, and listen to this phrase, and they were soon forgotten. Now, you know, and I know, if you get the newspaper or you go online and you read the obituary column, they don't say anything in there about so-and-so died lost. You know why they don't want to say that? They're embarrassed to say it. They're embarrassed to say that I had a loved one or I had a family member that never lived for the Lord. They lived for the world. Church was not on their agenda. The Bible was not on their agenda. God was not on their agenda. Righteousness was not on their agenda. They didn't live for the Lord, and so they died and went to hell. you never find that in the obituary, but I like what Dr. Oliver Green said years ago. I heard him say this. He's on our radio station seven days a week, nine o'clock every day. Uh, people still get saved listening to Dr. Green, although he's been in heaven for years and years. But Dr. Green said this. He said, if somebody spends their life in the bar, they don't frequent the house of God, and they curse the house of God, and they curse the man of God, and, and uh, they have nothing to do with the Word of God, and they have nothing to do with righteousness, and uh, they hurt their family, and they take the money that would put food on the table and clothes on their back, and they pour it down their mouth and alcohol. Family has to go uh, without the, the appropriate things of life. He said when that person dies, they shouldn't clean him up, put him in a casket, and roll him down in a church in a place he didn't want to go while he was living. Said they ought to put him in a casket and push it in front of the bar and let the bartender preach his funeral. Now that's not popular, but it makes sense. Why in the world would we want to take somebody to a place when they died that they didn't care to go to while they were living? Now, here's a group of people in this chapter that contributed something to the cause of Christ worthwhile. They helped the saints. They helped the apostle Paul. They ministered to him on behalf of the Lord. They did what they did because, number one, they loved the Lord Jesus Christ supremely. And now as Paul writes back to the church of Rome, these people come to his mind. And he says over and over in this chapter, greet these people, salute these people, take them by the hand, let them know we love them, let them know we appreciate their works of love, let them know that we appreciate the contributions they have made to the church of Rome. Now, we've looked at several of them. I've looked at the, this chapter down through the years, and I never thought a whole lot about the, these names, more like uh, more like uh, uh, tracing your family members and genealogy and anything else. But this is powerful because this is a representation of a church from all different classes, all different backgrounds, people coming together, people working together to get the work of God done. And tonight we come to another couple in this church of Rome that the Apostle Paul mentions. And I just mentioned them in a few moments ago in our text verse. Now, I'm doing this because I want us to get all of the meat off of the bone we can get as we uh, read this chapter and we see the importance of everybody in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And evidently, evidently, in our text verse tonight, we find two ladies who contributed so much to the church of Rome, and evidently, from the wording of our text verse this evening in verse number 12, evidently, we are looking at two twin sisters because their names are so closely related. Trihena and Triposa sounds like here's a couple of ladies who are in all probability born as twins into a family. Now, that was important. That's how they got here. But you know what's most important? They got born into another family. And that other family was the family of God. And that's the reason they're mentioned here. They're mentioned here because they became a part 
of God's family. Now listen, listen, it's vitally important. The greatest birth, we, we can have a birth of nobility. We can be born over there in England and we can be a part of that mess they've got over there. They can't get along among themselves. Uh, one of those boys came over here and they let him, they let him address the United Nations He's living in America, and when he addressed the United Nations, he spoke evil of the United States. Well, bless his little miserable heart. He don't have to live here. I'd rather he didn't. I'd feel better about it if he left and take her with him. Now, he, he, amen. But now, you can be born in royalty and still die and go to hell. But you can be born again and go to heaven. And that's what's so good about these folks here. They've been born into a physical family, but they have been born into a new family, and that is the family of God. Now, Paul says something about them that's interesting, and I hope this can be said about all of us tonight in verse number 12. He said, who labored. Now, notice what he said here. They labored in the Lord. You would know these people by what they were doing. And their associations as they do these things would, would tend to lead the people around them to believe these folks here love the Lord. That's the reason they're doing what they're doing because they love the Lord and they are involved in the Lord's work. They're involved in the Lord's work. They're involved in that which is eternal. They're involved in building the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you something. I've been going down this road now for a long time. And I just want to give a little brief testimony tonight and say this. I am so thankful for the women in our churches. And I've been at this thing 50 plus years, all total, 43, nearly 43 years here. And I'll tell you, it's wonderful to know that churches can have a backbone of women who are faithful to the church, and we're going to look at more of that here just in a moment, who contribute so much to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, my friend, uh, some of the main people that's carried the load uh, through the years of where I've pastored have been good, godly women coming to church under adverse circumstances. Uh, and in many instances, in many instances, uh, Husband would curse them. I'm thinking right now of a dear lady. She had to endure the, uh, the cursing, uh, uh, the abuse of a husband. When she walked out the door to go to church, he'd cuss her. She'd come back from church. He'd make fun of her and say, well, did you get religion tonight? Did you have a good time over there fellowshipping with your hypocrites? She had to go through that every time she went to church, but it did not dampen her. Every time the door was open, she was there. And I've seen her cut loose a few times. And that's in my home church. I've seen her cut loose a few times. And she would stand in one place and shout it out. And we had wooden floors. And she'd stand in one place and her feet was going up like on one of these uh, machines that you work out on. When you pedal like that, that's the way she's standing in place, just doing like that. And you could hear her, her feet just popping that wood floor. She's holding her hand, sometimes shout out her hairpins uh, because she was close to the Lord uh, and Jesus meant something to her. Jesus meant more to her than the abuse she got for going home uh, and she remained faithful to the Lord. And I can say during my tenure there, probably about 15 or 20 years, uh, she came to church. She never missed unless she was sick or providentially hindered. And she came on to church. And one day the pastor went by and began to witness to her husband. Uh, and uh, he bowed his head and got saved by the good grace of God. And he testified that one reason why he got saved uh, was because he had a godly woman, uh, a godly wife that wouldn't take no for an answer. I mean, she just kept going on to church. She was faithful to church. She came home. But most importantly, not only was she faithful to church, 
She lived it when she got home. She prayed in his presence. She read her Bible in his presence. Uh, she played the radio and listened to gospel preaching uh, in his presence. Uh, and after so many years, uh, he had to holler, calf rope, I can't handle it any longer. And he got under conviction and he got saved by the good grace of God. Had it not been for the faithfulness of his wife, he would have probably died and gone to hell. He's in heaven tonight. She's in heaven tonight. They've both been gone for a number of years, uh, but he's in heaven tonight because of the faithfulness of his godly wife. Uh, down through the years, there's been more women coming on to church where their sorry husband wouldn't come to church, uh, and he'll lay at home uh, and soak, soak up the suds uh, and uh, moon pies and beer and chew his red man, spit it in a in a pop bottle uh, and sit by his, uh, uh, sit by his uh, television set uh, and watch somebody out on the coast, uh, some kind of religious, modern religious programmer out on the coast somewhere and send his money. If he sends any money, he'd send it out there. And when he gets sick, he can call that pastor out there. He won't show up, but he'll expect the local pastor to show up. That's good preaching, Brother Beatty. I know it is. Now, I want you to notice, here's some people, they're laboring, notice what it says, they're laboring in the Lord. They're laboring on behalf of the Lord. They're laboring because they're in the family of God, and they love the Lord, and they just determined, we're going to serve the Lord. But notice, there's another word here, there's four words here that's vitally important. Notice what they said, uh, who labored in the Lord. Now we've looked at, looked at that word labored before here in the 16th chapter of the book of Romans. Same meaning tonight. The word labored there means labor to the point of weariness. To labor to the point of exhaustion. They just kept going. They kept going. I'm standing in this pulpit tonight saved by the grace of God to a great extent because of two godly women in my teenage years who taught my Sunday school class in two different churches. There's a church over, over in uh, Yadkinville. Uh, it was at one time a basket plant. It's where they made uh, tobacco baskets. It had shavings on the floor. And they turned it into a church. My dad taught Sunday school there. And um, I, I've, I've gone by there a few times. It's almost heartbreaking now. There's, there's weeds there and stuff's grown up. Uh, Brother Seats that used to uh, come here and fill in for me when I was uh, out preaching. Uh, he pastored that church. And uh, he left that church didn't leave the church. He continued the church on, but he moved it down in Courtney over in Yadkin County, God's country, and uh, built a beautiful log church over there. But it was known when I was going there, it was no, <laughs> I don't know where they, why they came up with this name, but it was known as Job's Tabernacle. And we went there, and I remember my dad taking me there as, uh, as a young man, a young boy, and uh, you go in the front door, and there's about three steps that went up into a room, which was the office. The office where they did the book work for uh, that, uh, the company, and that's where my Sunday school class was. And I remember being in that Sunday school class, and this godly woman, whose husband was uh, as mean and hateful as he could be, but this woman came in with a mellow spirit. And I can see her right now as she would stand up in the front of my Sunday school class and she would, she would teach that class and she would get turned red in the face because she was giving it everything she had. I can see Mrs. Wright right now as she stood up there and taught us. But you know the thing that stands out the most for Mrs. Wright right now? The tears. And she'd stand up there and she'd weep over us. And she'd beg us to get saved. She'd beg us to serve God. And that had an impact on me. 
And I've never forgot that. And then my dad went to another church. The other church was where I got saved. And there was another lady there that stood up and taught my Sunday school class. And you've heard me tell this story. It was, an, it was a basement church. <clears throat> and we had, a, uh, had a, a wire strung across in front of the pulpit and had, a, had sheets hanging on that wire. And my Sunday school class was up in the choir, and they had an adult class that went on at the same time. Now, you could imagine how much soundproofing that a sheet will give between two classes. But I remember Miss, uh, the, uh, the lady that was uh, teaching my Sunday school class there, uh, Mrs. Craven, Mrs. Craven. And she was the Pentecostal stripe. Now, she, most Pentecostals, they really live good. They live close to the Lord because they, they're afraid if they don't, they'll lose it. And, and she distinguished herself. And she had her hair up in a big old bun on the back of her head. And she had a long, always wore long dresses almost down to the floor. And she would stand up there. And I think she thought she was called to preach. And she really let her, she let her rip. I can remember her standing up there in a preaching mode. And I remember one Sunday she held up a pint jar full of cigarettes and told us how evil they were, and, uh, how th that was a sin. I mean, she'd use object lessons. But I've never forgot her. I have never forgot this lady. She stood up there, and like the other lady I was talking about, she wept over my soul. They found her. Years after I left there and went on to the Baptist church, uh, I got word that they found her. She died on her knees in front of the sofa praying. And they found her laying on the sofa with her knees on the floor. She was talking to the Lord when she got promoted. That's the kind of lady she was. These ladies had a profound impact on my life. Uh, my mother had a profound impact upon my life. One of the greatest women I ever met in my life was my mother. She loved me. She loved the Lord. And all the influence she had on me. My mom was so particular. Uh, she, you couldn't take her picture unless every hair was in place. Uh, my mom would, uh, when she'd have her birthday, I'd go over here and get her, I'd get her a dress or something for her birthday, and I'd like to get something that was shiny because she liked shiny clothes. And she'd get in front of the mirror and she'd primp and primp and primp and just kept on. But boy, I, I remember my mom, what a Christian woman she was. Listen, I'm just trying to say, Paul is writing here and he's naming a bunch of women because these women loved the Lord enough they had had an impact upon his life and they'd had an impact upon the church. And these were not just ordinary people. These were people who love the Lord supremely and they're working and laboring, as he says here, in the Lord. And they are laboring to the point of exhaustion. They are giving it their best. They, they're not cutting corners. They're dedicated to the task. Now, Paul says here, you greet them. You let them know that you appreciate their contribution to the church of Rome. You take them by the hand. You shake their hand. You tell them, you praise God for them, that they have contributed so much to the ongoing success of the church over there in Rome. He said we need to give honor to whom honor is due, and these people are worthy of the honor because they have labored because of their overflowing love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to say to our dear ladies in this church, thank you for loving the Lord. Thank you for being faithful to the Lord. You know, somebody has said the Sunday morning crowd reflects the uh, popularity of the preacher. The Sunday night crowd re reflects the popularity of the church. And the Wednesday night crowd reflects the popularity of what they think about Jesus. And I want to tell you tonight, I, I appreciate the ladies. The ladies here, they, they have so much to offer, and they've given so much through the years. Right now, thank God, I don't know who's back there tonight, but thank God for the ladies who are back there in the nursery. Oh, isn't that wonderful? On Sunday morning, if we turned that crowd loose out here, there wouldn't nothing happen but crying. We'd cry too. 
Thank God for the ladies that go back in the nursery. Thank God when we have a meal for the ladies that place before us all of that wonderful food. I mean, we got ladies in here could open up their own restaurant because the food's that good. Amen, men? Amen. Amen. I don't look at some of you and tell you've been eating some of it. Now, Paul is appreciative to these twin sisters for what they have contributed to the church of Rome. Now, let's move on, 12b. Look at the last part of that. He said, greet Paris. Now, there's something here very interesting about Paris. Uh, notice he said, which labored much in the Lord. Now, notice the two words before the name, the beloved. Now, that's important. That implies that she is an older saint, the beloved. That implies that she is greatly loved by the other people in the church. Uh, that means that she has been faithful through the years, and the other people recognize her faithfulness, and the other people are so thankful, and they look up to her. And, and I'm sure that some of the younger ladies in the church, if they came across problematic areas in their life, I'm sure they would look up this individual right here, and they would say, hey, I want, I want you to pray for me. I want you to help me. It might be that here's an individual that's uh, uh, got, got up in the years and maybe has to be helped into the church or carried into the church, uh, don't know what's going on in their life, but we call them people matriarchs. Matriarch is an older lady, is someone who's on up in years, who's highly respected, highly looked up to uh, as a great example of spirituality, a great example of Christianity. I'd ask all the ladies in here uh, this evening, can that be said of you, of your family and those who love you? They look at you as a great example of what Christianity is all about, a great example of what it means to be born again, a great example of what it means to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what's happening right here. Here's an individual that has been an example of godliness and this person's been an example of purity and this person has been an example of wisdom uh, and uh, and, and the family probably highly respects her, but most importantly, the church family greatly respects her because she's been faithful for so many years and she's contributed so much for so long. And I think back through the years of ministry and I think about people like this. Uh, they're looked up to. They're appreciated. They've got personality plus uh, and they've given of themselves unreservedly for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. As the words here say, in the Lord. Uh, that means they love the Lord and they're serving for the Lord and they're serving in the Lord and they're serving because of the Lord and they're serving because they love the Lord. Uh, let me ask us tonight, what is it that motivates us to do the things that we do for the church. It ought to be right at the top of the list because I love the Lord Jesus Christ supremely. What is it on Sunday morning when the rain is pitter-pattering on your roof uh, and you've never felt a bed sleep any better than it does, but yet you get up and come to church? Why do you do that? Uh, because you love the Lord Jesus Christ and you want him to know you love him. And on Sunday, Sunday night when you're tired many times, you get up and come on to church. Why do you do that? You do it because you love the Lord. Why did you come in here tonight? Many of you are tired. Many of us are tired in body, but we're here tonight. Why do we show up tonight? tonight. We're here to show our allegiance to our commander in chief. Uh, we're here tonight because Jesus Christ is worthy of us being here tonight. We come to let the world know that our car on Wednesday night is sitting in the parking lot of the Berean Baptist Church uh, because we love Jesus Christ supremely. Oh, these are good, good godly people we're reading about here tonight. Now, Let's move to verse 13. Here's an individual that Paul's very appreciative for. He said, salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. 
I want to say three things hurriedly about Rufus tonight. First of all, I want to talk about his person. And secondly, I want to talk about his praise. And thirdly, I want to talk about his parents. First of all, I want to talk about his person. Notice, if you will, salute Rufus. Now, there's a lot of speculation about who Rufus is. But let me tell you where the speculation lays heavy. The speculation lays heavy that this Rufus is the son of the individual who carried the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give you the verse in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, verse 21. And they compelled one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. People who have looked at this through the years have basically come to the conclusion that here's the son of the man who helped Jesus carry his cross up to Golgotha's hill. And if that be the case, and there's a good possibility that it is, what happened outside of Jerusalem had an impact upon his life that he never got over. Now, my friend, I wasn't there physically. Neither was you. But I want you to hear what I'm about to tell you. We was there in the spiritual realm. Because Jesus represented us on the cross. He who knew no sin became sin for us. That we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I want to tell you tonight, I want you to listen. We hear this so much down here in the Bible Belt. I'm afraid it gets to where it don't really mean much to us. I don't ever want to get over Calvary. I don't ever want to get beyond Calvary. When I may get a little tired in body, I want to go back a little while and camp down there at the foot of the cross. When I get discouraged, I want to go back. And I want to camp down there at the foot of the cross. Maybe I want to go through the Gospels and read about the crucifixion one more time. Because I don't want to ever forget it. Because that, my friend, is where we got rescued. That's, because, that's where we got saved. I don't ever want to forget that. And I'm convinced that the people who stood at Golgotha and they felt the engulfing of the darkness from 12 o'clock noon until 3 o'clock noon when the sun should have been at its brightest. It went out because Jesus was becoming sin for the world. And God pulled the curtain between time and eternity and refused to look at his own son, turned his back on his own son so that he would not have to turn his back on us. They're on Golgotha's hill. And I know that the people who were up there, many of them had a transformation in their life because of the testimonies we have in the Bible. That old burly Roman soldier, I, I'm convinced that the most uh, muscle-bound soldiers, the uh, ones who'd probably been trained the most, the roughest soldiers Rome had to offer, they put them around the cross. And one of them shuddered while the ground was quaking beneath his feet and said, truly, Amen. this was the Son of God. It had an impact on him. Oh, Peter, he's weeping now. He realizes what he's done. John standing down there at the foot of the cross and he hears Jesus say to John, John, I want you to take care of my mother now. John is there in the darkness. John hears the cries from the cross. No wonder we have 
the Gospel of John teaching us how to be saved. Uh, no longer we have the epistles of John teaching us how to live now that we are saved. And no, no longer, no wonder that we have the book of the Revelation uh, telling us about end time events. That comes, my friend, from a direct source of someone who stood at the foot of the cross. Uh, and I, I, I could imagine that Mary, his mother, is standing there because in the prophetic utterance that was given to Mary by Simeon said the day is going to come when a spear is going to be thrust through your own heart and she's standing there at the foot of the cross seeing her son die on the cross for the sins of the world. Everybody around that cross out of that darkness uh, had something to happen to them that they took to the grave with them. They never forgot it. And I don't want to forget it tonight either. We shouldn't forget it. And here's Rufus. He's busy in the church and Paul is saying, I want you to, uh, I want you to, uh, I want you to salute Rufus. Uh, this just might be the one who's working and laboring because he recognizes what has been told to him and, and the characteristics that surround his family. He's probably an individual whose roots go back to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. But secondly, his praise in verse 13. He said, salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord. Now let me tell you the simplicit, simplistic understanding of that, those three words, or four words, chosen in the Lord. We could get up here tonight and we could labor that truth and we could talk about election and predestination and all that, but the bottom line is, People don't go to hell because they were predestined to go there. They go there because they choose to go there. John 3, 16 still says, for whosoever, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him. And the last chapter of the revelation, God said, before you close this book, you give people a last, one last opportunity. The spirit and the bride say, come, let him that hear say, come. And here it is. And whosoever will let him come and take of the water of life freely. The last message in the book of the Revelation was a message of conversion and salvation. God said, whosoever will may come and take of the water of life freely. He said this guy's chosen in God. The bottom line is, let me tell you exactly what that means. He's saved. Amen. Now we can argue, I like what the fellows said years ago. Somebody said something to him about election and people elected to go to hell. He said, my prayer is God save the elect and elect some more to be saved. The Bible, somebody said it this way, that you could put over the door as you go out of the auditorium, elect before the foundation of the world. And you go outside the door and look back and you could write on the other side of the door, whosoever would choose to come before the foundation of the world. Because God knew before the foundation of the world who would be saved. That's the kind of God. I don't have a little peanut head God. Uh, he knows everything. And, uh, and the bottom line is here, uh, Rufus is living in the marvelous grace of God. The bottom line is, uh, Rufus is living in the power of the Lord. The bottom line is, uh, here's somebody who's enjoying being saved to the extent, Paul said, here's a guy that's serving in the church of Rome. He's chosen. Uh, God has his hand on him. He's working. He's laboring. He may be teaching. I don't know. He might be preaching. He, he might have a Sunday school class. He may be going out knocking on doors. I don't know. I know this. He's in the Lord. And because he's in the Lord, he's working. He's laboring. He's doing something in the church. And Paul said, greet him. Shake his hand. Tell him we appreciate him. But let's watch something else here. He said, I want you not only to salute Rufus chosen in the Lord, but he said, you salute his mother and mine. That's very interesting. First of all, that means that he had a saintly mother. And everybody in here that's had a godly mother, you've got a lot to be thankful for. You've got a lot to be thankful for. And if there's children here tonight and has a godly mother, you got a lot to be thankful for. 
Well, let me tell you something. If you, had, if you didn't have, then you ought to make up your mind, I'm going to be that. I'll be a godly mother. I'll set the example. I'll let people see Jesus in my life. Now, I believe, and a lot of other people who have written about this, believe that the possibility exists that the mother of Rufus, who would be the wife of the one who carried the cross, and the mother of Rufus evidently took care of the Apostle Paul somewhere down the journey of his life. It could have been that she ministered to the Apostle Paul when he was getting his education down at Jerusalem. He sat at the feet of Gamaliah. Gamaliah was one of the most learned theologians, theologues of his day. There's good possibility that she provided housing. There's good possibility she provided a place for him to stay. There's good possibility that she provided meals for him. There is a good possibility because Paul was incarcerated and Paul was scourged. There's a possibility that she poured oil in his wounds. Whatever she did, she took the place of a godly mother. And she became that to the Apostle Paul. And he said, I want you to go over there and shake the hand of Rufus. And I want you to let him know we appreciate him. We love him. And I want you to go to the mother and let her know that I appreciate all she's done because not only was she a mother to him, she's been a godly mother to me. <laughs> Years ago, my first church, there was a... There was a lady there. She was this typical grandmotherly type person, always got a smile, always, honey, how are you doing? Uh, honey, I, I, you're precious. Honey, I love you. And that being my first church, she took me and my wife under her wing. And we'd come to church, she'd make a beeline to us, and she'd just love on us and love us. Uh, she meant so. Her name was Dorothy Moxley. I'll never forget Dorothy. She's in heaven now. But she meant so much to me and my dear wife. And I like to think that this is the type of lady that you have right here. I remember when uh, 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 Brother Rick back here's mom uh, was still living and brother back here, uh, Troy, I remember when uh, my mom died and I preached her funeral and uh, the next, the, I think it was the following Sunday morning. Uh, here, here comes Mrs. Robinson in my office. Walked right up to my desk. Looked me right in the eye. Said, your mother's dead now. You're going to need a mother. I'll be your mom. Man, I never forgot that. And she was that. Don't say anything against the preacher around her. You'll get your eyes gouged out. Amen, Somebody went down to her house and tried that, and she ran them off, I heard. Oh, that's the kind of people that Paul's writing about right here. He said, uh, he said I, here's what I want you to do. I want you to salute, shake the hand. I want you to, uh, to, to do that to Rufus and his mother and mine. She treated me like her own son. You ever had anybody around you to do that? That's what Paul said. She was like a mother to me. Whatever arena she ministered to him in he said hey I think back right now I'm writing this letter to the church of Rome I'm thinking about the people who are great people you know what he's saying in, in essence here's the bottom line that some people in this world who are first in line down here they're going to be at the back of the line up there and some of those people down here who are in the back of the line down here they never get any attention but behind the scenes or wherever they are, they're real. They love the Lord. They pray. Their, their name's never planted on the front of the newspaper. 
uh, they hardly known outside of their community, but they love the Lord and they make an impact and they make an impression and they may so to appear at the back of the line down here, but they're going to be at the front of the line when they stand in the presence of the Lord because they were faithful Christians loving the Lord and let it be expressed through their life and their living. That's the kind of person we got here. Old Rufus, his person, his praise, his parents, a godly mother. And then in closing in verse number 14, we have what I call a superior group here. In verse number 14, he names five people who evidently are a support group for an assembly of people over there in Rome. And he says about these people in verse number four, he said, you salute them. Isn't it amazing over and over, he wants to make sure that these people get their hands shaken. He wants to make sure that somebody says, we love you. He wants to make sure that somebody says, thank you for the work you're doing. Now, I don't know. Uh, we're not told. We, we, we surmise that there's a possibility that these five people, they could have had a church in their home. They could have led a church in their home. Uh, they could have led a Bible study. Uh, they could have been a group of people that took turns preaching or they took turns going out together and witnessing and trying to get people saved. But it's a support group. Uh, if they were nothing else, they were prayer warriors. Here's a group of people that's come together in the house of the Lord, working on behalf of the Lord, five of them working together for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ and the brethren which are with them. Now, who would that be? Well, it could be anybody, but there's a good possibility it was slaves because Rome, and I've said this earlier, Rome was a place of immense slavery, and it could very well have been that they won these people to the Lord, and they no longer call them slaves. They now call them brethren because they're ministering in the house, but they're ministering now as Christians. I was talking to somebody this week. I'm finished. I was talking to somebody this week about old John Jasper. If you ever get an opportunity to purchase a book, it's called Rhapsody in Black. I purchased it years ago. It may be out of print, but there's probably some used ones out there. You ought to buy it. John Jasper preached at the Six Mount Zion Baptist Church in Richmond, Virginia. I've been in that church. If you're going up 95 through Richmond, Virginia, uh, 95 will kind of make a turn there in Richmond and you'll probably go about another three or four tenths of a mile and if you look up on a hill you can see the back of a big brick church up there. And that's John Jasper's church. He held services every Sunday afternoon about one or two o'clock. And uh, it's a church, huge auditorium. They got a balcony that goes all the way around that auditorium and it was filled on Sunday afternoon. And prominent doctors and lawyers from Richmond, Virginia would go out to hear John Jasper preach the gospel. And one Sunday afternoon, there was a prominent, is either a lawyer or doctor in Richmond, Virginia, walking down the street, going to hear John Jasper preach. Somebody sitting on the front porch said, hey, where are you going? He said, I'm going over to hear John Jasper preach. He said, why do you want to go over there and hear him murder the king's English? He said, I'm not going over there to hear him murder the king's English. I'm going over there to hear him talk about his Jesus. Amen. What a man John Jasper was. As a slave, um, he had the tragic, tragic thing to happen to him. They took his wife and sold her out from under him. They'd been married for years. And he never did get to see his wife again. But he kept on preaching. He kept on being faithful to the Lord. And when he came down to die, somebody standing by his bed and they said, John, how you doing? He said, I'm doing fine. He said, I'm walking up and down the side of the river looking for a place to cross. That's dying with dignity. That's dying in glory. That's dying in the fullness of grace. And there's a good possibility here when it talks about these brethren in the house. It's a good possibility it could be those slaves that uh, have been won to the Lord. 
uh, by the people in the house. And uh, in verse number 15, the last part of that, it said, all the saints which are with them. That could very well be, again, that could very well be slaves because multitudes of these people got saved by the grace of God. Oh, these are unknowns in the world, but they're known in heaven because they stood up for the cause of Christ and they were heroes, heroes of the heroes. And while they have all of the Herods and the Pilots and all of these czars over there in Rome who believed themselves to be God, they were not shining in the presence of God. It was these people that are faithful, these slaves, these, these humble Christians that are out there winning people to the Lord to the extent that they said, hey, there's, there's saints over there in Caesar's household. How they become saints? Because they had saints that was making saints by their faithfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ. What's people going to say about you when you're gone? Are they going to talk about how you love the Lord? Are they going to talk about what a godly person he was? Think about it. Because they're not going to think about us like necessarily we would want them to think about us. They're going to think about us by how we actually lived. And may when all of us are in heaven, our families and our friends and neighbors, when our name comes up, may they be able to say, you know, that person loved the Lord. That person was dedicated to the Lord. That person was serious about serving the Lord. Man, I got family members uh, that's gone, just gone. But I want to so live that when I'm gone, They'll have to say, well, I didn't agree, but I'll tell you one thing, he's faithful to the Lord. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. The songwriter said years ago, take the world, but give me Jesus. He's worthy tonight. He's all that matters. Let's stand with our head bowed, our eyes closed for just a moment. If you need to come to the altar, if there's a need in your life tonight, make your way down. May the people around us, may the people who know us the best be able to say, hey, that's a Christian right there. That's a Christian right there. That person right there really loves the Lord. Father, I want to thank you tonight for your word. I want to thank you tonight that we have examples here to follow. I want to thank you tonight that we have people here who loved you enough that they got in this Romans Hall of Fame to be an example to us this evening. And I pray tonight you'll help us. I pray tonight, Lord, you'll touch us. Help us to be sold out to Jesus. Lock, stock, and barrel, give him our best. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Sing the stands if others need to come, would you come? Jesus calls us for the tumult of our lives while restless he day by day his sweet voice soundeth saying Christian follow me Jesus calls us from the worship of the vain world's golden star from each idol that would keep us saying Christian love me more in our joy sorrows, days of toil, and hours of ease. Still he calls in cares and pleasures. Christian, love me more than these. Jesus calls us by the mercies. Savior, may we hear thy call. Give our hearts to thy obedience. Serve and love thee best of all. Jesus calls us for the tumult of our lives while restless sea. Day by day his sweet voice soundeth, saying, Christian, follow me. Jesus calls us from the worship of the vain world's golden star. From each 
language idol that would keep us saying, Christian, love me more. In our joys and in our sorrows, days of toil and hours of ease, still he calls in cares and pleasures, Christian, love me more than these. Jesus calls us by thy mercies, Savior, may we hear thy call. Give our hearts to thy obedience, serve and love thee best of all. Now, Heavenly Father, I want to thank you tonight for your word. I thank you for these great heroes. We don't know what their physical accomplishments consisted of, or even if they had any. We sure do know they had some spiritual accomplishments. And I know that right now in your presence, they never hated a minute they gave to you. They never regretted it. I thank you, Lord, that they gave their life lock, stock, and barrel to you unreservedly. Now tonight we can study them and learn about them that we may apply the truths of their lives to our own personal lives this evening. Bless us tonight. Bless our church. Bless our people. Minister to them. And we'll thank you for it because we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. And everybody said, amen. I love you. Good night and God bless you.